Persona 5 is a game characterized by its signature split gameplay. Half the time you're running around Tokyo, going to school, talking to friends, working part-time jobs, and the other half you jump into a metaphysical world where cognition is reality. There you use your supernatural powers to take down corrupt abusers in positions of power just like anyone who has ever had a shitty boss fantasizes about in their cubicle. This dual life simulation is incredibly interesting. But one part of it I find to be endlessly fascinating is how different villains are represented in the metaverse. For example, we have more simple ones like Madarame's art museum, which is a gaudy and over-the-top showcase of all of his stolen art. Or you have Kamoshida's literal palace that represents how he sees himself as a king. But while these more simple palaces are interesting, I'm more personally engrossed in the ones that stand out from the crowd. In other words, the non-traditional palaces. These were, in order of appearance, Futaba's Pyramid, Sai's Casino, and Maruki's mental health facility? I really don't know what you would call this palace. Either way, I wanted to get some perspective here, so I threw the question to you guys to see if my thoughts aligned with the public. So, in a community post, I asked for your personal favorite palaces with the hypothesis that the top three most popular would be the previously mentioned non-traditional palaces. Specifically, I wagered that the number one most popular would be Maruki, the number two would be Sai, and the number three would be Futaba. And to no one's surprise, I was exactly right. Just as I predicted, Maruki's palace was by far the most popular, with Sai and Futaba coming in at number two and three respectively. All of this got me thinking, what is it about these three palaces that make them so appealing? Not just to myself, but to all of the people who responded. So with that question in mind, I wanted to take a brief look at each of these palaces to determine what they share and why they're so interesting to so many players. To start things off, let's jump right into things with the number one pick, Maruki's palace. Now, seeing as Maruki's dungeon is the very last one in the game, it has a special role to fill. Maruki's arc is the culmination of everything in Persona 5 Royale, and the palace reflects that, offering some of the most unique and exotic personas to test your skill and tactical decision making. On top of the mechanical challenge, this palace also offers a swath of moral challenges as well, seeing as Maruki's story arc revolves around the clashing ideals between him and the Phantom Thieves. This moral dilemma adds depth and weight to each interaction and creates a strong sense of purpose while in the palace, but all of this theming and layering would go to waste if the dungeon didn't look the part. Visually speaking, this may be the most unique palace, with its bright white color scheme and a friendly atmosphere in some places. No other palace can feel so sterile, yet simultaneously unsettling. Then, near the top of the palace, it starts to transition towards biblical allusions with its proverbial Garden of Eden, Tree of Life. Not only does this duality make for a fun, aesthetically pleasing place to walk around in, but it also reflects Maruki's progression through the story. He changes from a simple man trying to use psychology and cognitive science to help those in need, to a man on a power trip with a raging god complex, all of which we see reflected in the palace through the architecture and layout. Shadows here are another interesting visual oddity, as some of them are outright friendly and will interact with you as you would expect from a human. This, in combination with the lab coats and clipboards, all plays into the surreal and medical atmosphere of the palace. Then you have the back rooms of the dungeon that provide a stark contrast with the meticulously clean white rooms that Maruki wants us to see. These areas are all hidden away and left in the dark, as if they're memories and thoughts being repressed and hidden away. This idea is supported by the various recordings that we have to track down here. And finally, tying all of this together, we have the background music. The music in Maruki's Palace is on another level. Gentle Madman is a haunting track that sets a grim tone for the palace, yet in true Persona fashion, it also carries with it a strong rhythm and melody that's almost calming. The addition of the synth complements the ethereal nature of Maruki's story and creates a surreal atmosphere unlike any other palace. Everything here just sort of feels off, but in the most interesting and exciting way. Then, the other track we hear, Another Ideology, presents us with a somber tune that sets a grim tone. The main guitar plays a melancholic tune that feels emotional and fitting for the weight of the story, and then just beneath the main melody is a strong bass line and percussion track that keeps the pace up and blends it perfectly with what we've come to expect from the music in this game up to this point. The background music, paired with the design and theming, just makes you want to spend hours wandering around this place, taking in the details and oddities. Details that are also found in Sai's Casino. Now, Sai's Palace is another unique one. Even though it's the sixth palace in the game, it's actually the first one we see as it serves as the intro to the game. Now, this was likely done because this palace is a fucking banger, and the devs know it. The whole idea of this palace is meant to represent the justice system in a pretty scathing manner. 
As a casino, this palace relies on classic stereotypes and preconceptions of crooked casinos rooting back all the way to the early days of gambling in the States, when the mob controlled all the major gambling joints in Vegas. Just like in an unregulated casino, the deck is stacked against you in the legal system. Sai Nijima, being a public prosecutor, is the perfect person to represent this theme, as she's working in the very system that the Phantom Thieves are fighting. Obviously, this is all very connected to the immediate narrative, with Akechi and the district attorney and all that, but I'm more interested in the choice to display legal systems that are supposed to be fair and objective as rigged gambling houses wherein the individual is meant to fail. This is an excellent and poignant criticism of how corrupt and unfair certain systems can be. Unfortunately for me, however, I am terminally American, meaning my perspective on Japanese justice systems is limited at best. So discussion on this matter will have to wait for maybe a future video where I can really dedicate some more time and nuance to the topic. But I can say that from an American perspective, I see a lot of parallels to the American justice system and how it can be used and abused against the individual. But like I said, that's a conversation for another time. For now, let's look at one of this palace's more appealing aspects, the visuals. I think anyone who has been to Vegas can agree that the Strip at night is an intoxicating place, with all the bright lights, huge skyscrapers, and 24-hour entertainment. It can be a really fun place to spend a few nights if you're willing to overlook some of the less appealing traits inherent to the city. For these reasons, casinos are popular aesthetics in video games, and Sai's Palace fits right in with those themes. Everything is lit up and making noise, contributing to the chaotic yet intoxicating atmosphere that really makes you feel like you're in the middle of the Las Vegas Strip. This theming is further reinforced by the fun gambling-related challenges that illustrate how much control there actually is laying just beneath the chaos of the casino floor. Stuff like slot machines, card games, and even betting on fights are all represented here, and it really helps this place stand out. Instead of feeling like you're just running from room to room doing small trivial puzzles that only serve to halt your progression, it feels like you're exploring a real place and interacting with everything it has to offer on your own accord. And it just so happens that the stuff you're doing is necessary to progress. But this romp through the bright casino floor wouldn't feel half as engaging without the killer soundtrack that urges you ever forward. Whims of Fate is regarded by many to be the absolute best dungeon theme in the game, and it's easy to see why. This palace is the only one that sports vocals and lyrics in its normal background music, and it does so much to set this place apart from others. The whole time you're running around, you can't help but just groove with the funky bass and catchy lyrics. Seriously, on the first time I played through this dungeon, I would just leave my game on standing just outside a save room so I could listen to the track in the background while I did other stuff. It is absolutely a banger like no other. Finally, we have the number three pick and one of the first non-traditional palaces in the game. Futaba's palace is literally a pyramid, and with that comes some pretty clear implications. Historically speaking, much to the dismay of the History Channel, the pyramids were used as the final resting places of many a pharaoh. This means that they are essentially massive triangular crypts encasing the dead husks of rulers and pharaohs long departed. From this, we can surmise that Futaba feels trapped in her tomb and unable to escape which is an obvious metaphor for her PTSD and anxiety that keeps her trapped in her room in real life. Now, if you're somehow unconvinced of that, everything I've just said is pretty much just quoted dialogue straight from Shadow Futaba. Futaba makes my job really easy, as lots of the symbolism and imagery is laid pretty bare here, and presented to the viewer straight from her mouth. And because of that, many may be tempted to write it off as simple or shallow. After all, if all the answers are given to us right in the text, then what makes it so interesting? To this, I point you to the excellent theming, level design, and music. Visually speaking, Futaba's palace is super cool because it transports us to a fun and fictional version of a pyramid that we all imagined as kids. I know I'm not the only one who was let down by the reality that there actually isn't much going on inside the pyramids. As a kid who grew up on shows like Yu-Gi-Oh! that made ancient Egypt seem so cool and mysterious, it's really fun to see creative and interesting takes on the inside of a pyramid again. Everything is layered with booby traps and enemies, all guarding some secret treasure against grave robbers and any who would seek to disturb the holy ground. This Egyptian theme also gives way to many Egyptian-inspired personas that are some of my absolute favorites. I really love the creative approach to this palace, and the cool blend of technology with ancient carpentry just really sells me on the whole thing. But just like our other two examples, what would this palace be without its iconic music that I admittedly use way too frequently in my videos? The Days When My Mother Was There is an excellent and groovy track that may not stick out at first, 
The way I've always thought about this theme reminds me of anime intros, and yes, I'm serious, please just stick with me for this metaphor. It reminds me of when you're listening to the first intro of a season, and it's a banger, but then the second intro comes along, and at first it doesn't seem as good, but then it slowly grows on you more and more until you realize, holy hell, this track goes crazy. That is exactly how I felt slowly growing accustomed to this song. The bass is jazzy and fun, it's got excellent percussion, the main melody just sounds really good. Look, I'm no music expert, so I don't really have the lexicon to describe why I love this song so much, but just go listen to it for yourself, and I think you'll catch my drift. So now, after all three palaces have been analyzed, I think I can come to a conclusion on why these three stick out amongst the crowd. Each one belongs to a morally gray villain. Neither Maruki Sai nor Futaba ends up being evil like some of the other rulers, and I think because of this, they were given special attention in their palaces. Furthering the narrative complexity, each palace also sports excellent visuals that tie into the symbolism of their owners, making for a cohesive experience while discovering the story on your first playthrough. Lastly, the music is just good, and I know I'm no expert here, so if you refuse to take my word for it, I also did another poll on your guys' favorite palace music and to no one's surprise, the music for these three palaces was by far the most popular. Especially for Maruki and Futaba, I'm really shocked that Whims of Fate only came in at number three, because I was expecting it to be number one by a long shot, but you guys really loved Gentle Madman. Look, I think no matter how you cut it, the fact will always remain that these three palaces are truly special. And if nothing else, they serve to make the excellent game of Persona 5 Royale just that much better. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the video. If you made it this far, then you probably liked what I had to say. If that's the case, be sure to leave me a like so I know I'm doing something right. Also, be sure to leave me a comment letting me know what characters, personas, and themes you guys want me to talk about next time. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload. Best of all, it's free, and if it doesn't work out down the line, you can always unsub. No hard feelings. I also have a Twitter and an Instagram. If those are your bag, links to those will be below. But with all the YouTube stuff out of the way, I just want to say thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.